All right. Well, it's great to be here with all of you. Uh, I have to say the virtual world is surreal, but we're thrilled. And uh, this is the newest installment of our media literacy work uh, with the Dallas Public Library and with all of our partners here in Dallas. So thank you so much. I wanted to give just a, a brief roadmap for all of us for our discussion this evening. We'll be covering quite a bit. Um, first, I wanna ground us in PEN America's work in this space and what our research in the last several years around disinformation and media literacy has been. Um, and then really go through what some examples look like, what we've seen in regard to the pandemic, protests and election related content. Um, much of that is what occupies my time and much of the time of my colleagues at PEN America, uh, monitoring and looking at what we can anticipate in the months ahead as we ready ourselves for the 2020 election this November. And then we're going to really look at, and the heart of our work is our media literacy toolkit. Essentially, what are the tips and what are the concrete resources that you can implement in your daily digital practices to better understand and identify misinformation, disinformation? We'll, we will be covering the differences between all of that. Uh, and then we're going to close with the discussion. And I always love that part because it really gets everyone's juices flowing. And without further ado, I want to open it up and just introduce you all to some of what PEN America does in this space. You know, we are a research, I'm sorry, we are a membership organization for writers and allies, and we work at the intersection of literature, human rights, and free expression. And we've long understood that words can be used and they can also be manipulated and that there is this potential for words, whether they are written or spoken, to be distorted. That facts then can be used in their distortion to further various political or personal ends. And so starting in 2017, we began researching what the, this phenomenon looked like, you know, as the advent of the digital age has helped uh, proliferate content that is problematic, misleading, or false altogether, we've looked at what the spread of false information actually is doing to all of us. And really what we have found is that under the guise of news, you know, credible information, there have been several disturbing effects. I think one of them is really just our erosion in trust in the media and in each other. Um, this deteriorating trust really has somehow been coupled with our inability to distinguish facts from lies. And it threatens our democratic discourse. And so much of our first report, Faking News in 2017, just tried to examine what this new phenomenon was. Um, when we were doing research on the topic, we were referring to this phenomenon as fraudulent news. We have since sort of moved away from using terms like fake news because we know that others have co-opted that term. But we've really tried to understand what it means when our shared factual knowledge gets attacked and that the internet helps uh, all of that happen so quickly. Uh, how can platforms, for example, and how can other actors, whether they are government or civil society, help weigh in to make sense of all of this? Um, and frankly, more and more, these problems are no longer just sort of uh, at the fringe of what we're all aware of. And so in 2019, we re-examined the issue again, specifically looking at uh, with our report, Truth on the Ballot, how disinformation affected the 2018 midterm elections. And we considered what the prospects for 2020 would be. And frankly, at the time, you know, we had several conclusions. I'm going to kind of walk you through some of them because there were several core findings um, that help us just begin to dive into what disinformation really is and why uh, it's so dangerous. So one, you know, some of our findings were really around who is uh, behind disinformation. And we have found that Russian disinformation absolutely continues to be a threat to our elections. But that Russian agents of disinformation uh, are actually playing kind of this long game, if you will, that their focus is not merely, not just on influencing American electoral process, but on really stoking polarization political polarization, and sowing discord in our democracy. We've also then seen this rise in domestic actors uh, in the United States, such as American political actors utilizing disinformation tactics, much like our foreign actors have, 
but that they do that to try to lob disinformation and false narratives at their political opponents. We've also seen that over the last several years, you know, the tech companies and the platforms have made some efforts to reduce the spread of harmful content, misleading content, um, and otherwise try to inform people, uh, for example, with Facebook's political ad library about what is behind the content you are seeing. And yet, frankly, it's just not been enough. You know, while important advances have been made, I think it's important for us to understand as online users that a lot of the initiatives pose problems. And one of the core problems that Pet America has identified really centers on our work around free expression. We are absolutely committed to enhancing and promoting the ability of all of us to speak and to have access to other people's opinions. And so oftentimes the solutions around how to remove or even moderate misinformation, disinformation, and other troublesome content end up actually uh, removing legitimate speech. And so we, we have a sort of deep and, and long rooted tradition in being concerned about instances where solutions to remove dangerous content actually end up silencing and censoring certain groups. And so we've been very iffy about what are the solutions, what are the viable solutions when we're thinking about how to stem the spread of disinformation. And it's part of why we've actually come over and over again to the power of media literacy and the power to help educate and empower people who are online to make sense of what they see. Another thing that we've noticed over the last several years, this is sort of our fourth major observation, is the power and unfortunately the potency of micro-targeting. Micro-targeting is, well, I have to say, I think what could have at one time passed as maybe a hard-edged campaign message in the public arena. Now that we are so often online, that can actually move with laser-like efficiency to reach sub-segments of voters while absolutely remaining invisible to the larger public and certainly remaining invisible to ourselves. So the things that I might be shown on Facebook, for example, or on other platforms as sponsored content may be very carefully tailored and crafted for me and for the kinds of behaviors and practices that I exhibit. And that content may absolutely have zero similarity to what my colleagues, my friends, my partner, my siblings, my parents, all of those people may in fact be seeing different tailored content. And so frankly, the, the, the breakdown in our discourse often comes from that we're given different messages. And we then, what it means is that we rely on a different set of facts to connect with each other. And at the end of the day, when we think about the, the potency of disinformation in the election context, it means that the decisions we are making fundamentally are being targeted and undermined because we simply do not know how to make sense of what we are seeing. And so this really brings me to my final, the fifth observation that PEN America has been um, troubled by and trying to sound the alarm on, which is, I think, one of the biggest threats we've seen over the last several years is that Many felt disinformation is a, a terrible, terrible phenomenon that we have to stem. And yet there is this potential danger that actually it may become the new normal. That while it's maybe distasteful, it is not a disqualifying tactic in the political arena. And we are seeing in so many other contexts now, the pandemic, even in recent protests, the sort of proliferation and deluge of misleading content online which really brings us to how can we stem that and how can we help minimize? And frankly, I come back to over and over again, the, the ways that we have, have identified since 2017, what solutions should look like that center citizens and that center civilians who are online. And so we continue to be wary of these various solutions that simply uh, have an unintended consequence of silencing speech. And we've actually tried to think through what does it look like if we really want to empower people. And so this media literacy program was launched with that goal in mind. I have to say we launched our program before the pandemic hit. And so we had had this really wonderful dream uh, and the integrity and spirit of the program was to travel all over the country doing these types of sessions, but in person.
And so uh, the Dallas Public Library is one of our core partners in that. Uh, we imagined doing these in person, for example, and of course we're here now virtually on Zoom. But um, nevertheless, I think we'll kick it off because we're online more than ever. And now that we are all online and that we are uh, increasing the number of minutes, even hours that we're spending on social media, I think the power of media literacy is all the more uh, potent and exciting for us. So to ground us just a little bit, you know, I will say since the advent of uh, COVID, I have noticed, I've been trying to research what our internet usage has been. Um, it's gone up, I think over 20% now for Americans. Um, and we've also also seen that our social media consumption has gone up at least 50% since the onset of work from home and people now really uh, in a kind of state of limbo, if you will. It all then is compounded by as a sort of fodder for disinformation and that we are always online. What we know from other research partners, um, according to Pew Research, for example, um, more and more adults are spending time online and where they get their news is a really critical issue for us to begin considering. Um, for the most part, what we have found is that adult Americans actually in majority numbers are using social media as a pathway to their news, um, which means that they are using Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Snapchat, Tumblr, TikTok, you can see all of the social media platforms here as really a pathway. Um, I will often say social media sites are not news sources. Uh, they are pathways or gateways to news. And it's really important when we begin thinking about our own digital experience and taking a scan of that, understanding where we get our news. So it's sort of interesting if we're just beginning to think through those issues, ask yourself, for example, where do you receive news and information? Is it from news articles? Is it maybe from talk radio or podcasts? Um, is it sponsored content? Is it maybe the links in social media? Because I think that so many of us, uh, you know, the, the research from Pew, if you will, if you look back, this was from July of 2019. That is now almost a year ago. And so I think about the ways that I actually passively might get news, that I go on Facebook or Twitter at the end of my day, and I look at what my friends and colleagues have posted. And that's really the way that I have naturally and in a sort of very, very reflexive way sought out information. I don't even, I don't even think I could say that I've sought it out. It's really passive. And so just think through where are you getting your information? Is the majority of it posts that you find from your friends on social media? Are you actually proactively trying to go to news websites? It's useful just to begin thinking through what your digital experience is. And frankly, much of this actually, uh, I would say disinformation isn't new. So many people often ask me, well, is disinformation new because of the you know, advent of the digital age? And I say, absolutely not. Actually, Disinformation has been around for centuries. Um, here is just a little smattering of some examples throughout the ages of disinformation. Um, you know, I think about even in early United States publications when there were no standards for reporting, the use of um, smear you know, tactics and campaigns in which uh, reporters maybe will have lobbed uh, comments at others really because of the political fodder and the, the fertile ground for that. But it's important for us in, in this age now to really understand if we're in what I refer to as a di disinformation age, what are the different forms of misleading content? Because it's no longer just disinformation. And I wanna, if you come away with only a few things, I do want you to feel really empowered and confident about what the different definitions are of misleading content. So let's start with what disinformation is. Disinformation is demonstrably false information that is being presented as fact with the intention to deceive the public. Um, and it's really that intention element that's so critical when you think about disinformation. Because by contrast, misinformation is often used, frankly, interchangeably, I think, in reporting and in our public conversations. But misinformation means something very different. Misinformation is simply false information that's been created in error. And this could be for a number of reasons. It could be perhaps um, 
that it was created uh, with an authentic and credible news website or, or organization, and that there was simply a reporting error. And we'll talk a little later about some of the standards and ethics and reporting policies around news outlets and how often that can help begin to identify for you what's credible and what's not. But sometimes if there's just a simple reporting error, that's misinformation. At the same time, there may be instances where you share or I share a piece of content that is that began as disinformation, but once you share it, you don't have any intent to actually deceive people. Perhaps, and I certainly know that I, I would say probably all of us have fallen prey to reading a headline that is actually false and absolutely fabricated. And we think to ourselves, oh, I have to share this with my friends. I have to share this with my followers. This will absolutely help people. And when you share it, you in a way become a publisher of that disinformation, but without the intent, it's really just spreading misinformation. And so it's useful to think about how we all, if we have that power to be publishers in our own right, how can we actually help block the spread of disinformation? And so I think really the next question is, well, why are we so susceptible to it? That moment when you say to yourself, I have to share this, wow, why are we so susceptible to false information, whether it is disinformation that has been created to uh, you know, intentionally deceive or even misinformation? Um, I will say here are a range of ways that content can be misleading, which we will discuss a little bit later. But one of the reasons that I think disinformation is so um, potent and why we are so susceptible to it is really because of the illusory truth effect, which is kind of a, a thinking shortcut in our brains. Uh, we've adopted this gut level feeling that potentially the more we encounter something, the more we actually end up believing it. And so Facebook in 2016 actually did a preliminary study of this issue. Um, they pulled together various participants who were shown true and false headlines. And they were asked to evaluate these for truth. Um, similar uh, to a lot of what simulated activities now look like when we think about what are users doing online. Once they were shown the true and false headlines, they were then distracted. And then they were shown all those headlines again and other new headlines. And irrespective of what they, whether they knew that something was true or false, the second time that participants saw a headline, they were more likely to say it was true. And so there is this line that the researchers came up with that they said it seemed that every time a lie is repeated, it seems slightly more plausible. And honestly, that's really what the illusory truth effect is. It's that shortcut in our brains where we see something and we're like, oh, that, that seems right, that's true, because I've seen something akin to that before. And it really poses a problem when we think about how do we undo, how can we walk back those natural human tendencies that are really just kind of the perfect, perfect breeding ground for us to fall prey to disinformation. And then when it's coupled with things like confirmation bias, it just creates even more of a compounding effect. Confirmation bias is really when information confirms our views and that when it does, we tend to believe it. So in many ways, if you're thinking about what your digital experience is, are you seeking out news and information that might actually just confirm the things you already believe? Because in many ways, we need to start diversifying where and how we get information. Facebook, for example, has even noticed that um, in trying to break down users' uh, experiences and inability to discern truth, sometimes even little labels or, or pop-up notifications, there are frankly mixed results when we think about whether or not it triggers skepticism on the part of users. So how does disinformation work? I have to say this is really uh, one of my very favorite sections as I've done these workshops now, uh, almost dozen, I wanna say, almost a little over a dozen. I think a lot about um, what are the mechanics of disinformation? It's so easy to talk about or think about just the proliferation of false content online, but how does that actually happen? So one, I think that uh, disinformation we have to understand plays on our emotions. You know, emotions are manipulated, 
often they are fear, anger, uh, and other negative emotions. They're sort of, there's often a um, clickbait where the type headline or the same emotional reaction we have to disinformation. We feel that sense of urgency that we have to share something. Um, and often disinformation is crafted with that knowledge that we will try to do that. And then in the same breath, there is often this patina of credibility. Um, potentially disinformation can kind of feel real, that it just somehow seems plausible. And if we already are in a state where we have seen a headline, for example, or seen an image or video that really plays on our emotions and grabs us, we're already sucked in. And then oftentimes disinformation will really have this element of just, you see something and you say, huh, that feels, that feels right. That seems somehow real. Um, oft, we'll see examples of this, how accounts and sources somehow seem real. Um, often they are fake accounts. We've even seen fake news websites that are promoting and purveyors of disinformation. Um, but often that patina of credibility just further uh, enhances our inability to take a step back because we're kind of seduced into something because of our emotions and then something seems real. Um, I think a great example actually is the pandemic video. Uh, that is a documentary by a scientist who has been largely discredited for her research. Um, and in the middle of the pandemic, this documentary came out and became an absolute sensation, but it peddled disinformation and conspiracy theories that tried to ultimately uh, take major, major hits at leading scientists around the country that were leading the coronavirus response and task force in the United States. And what was interesting about that video was it felt real. Uh, when you begin watching it, the documentary kind of, it plays on your emotions. There's very evocative um, music and even a beautiful scene where this woman as the protagonist sets herself up as a whistleblower. Um, and it's just sort of in the style of documentaries where it feels credible and you want to hear it. You want to hear her story. The third, and I would say one of the most powerful ways that disinformation works is through automated uh, behavior, through bots, which are computer generated, and they are designed to appear to be users on social media. So if I were to post misinformation or even disinformation, if I post that, I will only probably get a certain number of people who see it or care or interact with that post. But because bots are able to act like real people and push content at record rates, the, the proliferation and the sort of mushrooming out of disinformation online can happen at record speed. And it means that getting in front of it, if you will, is super, super hard. Um, if we always have, especially on places like um, Twitter and even Facebook, if we have these fake accounts that are mimicking humans, right, and pushing content, and then those content pieces get incredible engagement, that then, if you see it as a user, naturally, of course, it plays on your emotions because you say, oh, well, this post got 2,000 likes, and it somehow has this patina of credibility, and it's just it's really hot right now. I want to share it. I want to do something with it. And then when we think about how the illusory truth effect really compounds this problem, we understand that the more we see things, the more we believe them. And so this will happen over and over again throughout our days, that without even uh, thinking twice, our passive and reflexive reaction is simply to accept what we see and to buy into oftentimes the kinds of headlines, images, videos, even accounts, and the the narratives crafted to fundamentally shift and stoke polarization. So I want to walk you through what some of the phases of disinformation are. Um, this is from our colleagues first draft news um, that really looked at how can we think about the, the shelf life, if you will, of what disinformation is when it gets created, produced, and reproduced. So I want to give you an example. Um, in July of 2016, a news hoax website published a headline 
saying that the Pope had endorsed Trump for president. Um, it, this was right around when uh, both of the primary presidential candidates had been selected. And what's interesting is that this actually came from a kernel of truth. So almost like a patina of credibility because the quote was actually part of a larger and real interview with the Pope. But he had actually been interviewed about the inability of the FBI to prosecute Hillary Clinton over her emails. And so the news hoax website used the language and his words and then spliced it up. And in doing that made it seem like he had endorsed Donald Trump for president. And so it's interesting, it started remember with that kernel of truth and then that was spun and distorted. Um, and what's interesting then is one, because of inauthentic behavior and because of automated uh, accounts, it was able to proliferate in massive numbers all over our social media platforms. Buzzfeed, for example, has estimated that that news story uh, in respect, in regard to the election was actually one of the most widely shared election stories. It had almost 1 million engagements as a post, people liking it, commenting, and sharing it. Um, and so we think about creation, production, reproduction of these news stories and potentially of disinformation writ large, well, there can be sort of the crafting, right? The, the creating of that quote from the Pope. That is the creation of disinformation. Clearly it seemed that it was intended to mislead people and to do so very, very intentionally. And then there is the production of it, right? Where the article itself gets published somewhere um, or someone can post a video perhaps. That's the production of it. Then there is this element of distribution where someone probably on the network, part of a campaign of bad actors, will distribute and push out that piece. And then it gets to us. It gets to everyday people and uh, we distribute it even wider. We, in a sense, reproduce. And it's why I come back to always saying, we almost publish in a way that if something has been created, produced and distributed out into the world, then all of us as online users have a decision and an ability and almost a power to decide whether we post and share something and engage with it or not. So I wanna give you some examples. What does this actually look like? Because we've certainly talked quite a bit in the abstract, but I will start with what are, um, what are we seeing with accounts? Because frankly, we've seen an absolute rise in unverified accounts. Um, that promote and serve as purveyors of disinformation. So here is a really great example. This is Rashida Tlaib um, posting on Twitter. It appeared to be a rather incendiary and controversial post. I'm not sure if you read this, what would you feel as a member of Congress? Rashida Tlaib is. Um, would you feel excited? Would you support her? Would you be furious, offended? I think that it is uh, in no uncertain terms meant to stoke some kind of intense emotional reaction. And what you will note though, is that it's a fake account. So the last name Talib, the L in her name is a capital I actually, and has not been verified. So in fact, if you are on Twitter or you're on Facebook and you see content that begins to play on your emotions or you find yourself thinking, oh my gosh, that's crazy, that's outlandish, or even that's offensive. You may wanna consider the source. You may want to begin considering, well, who is actually posting this? Is this Rashida Tlaib? Is this the real Rashida Tlaib? Um, and there are tools for knowing how to verify accounts that we'll be getting to later when we talk about our media literacy toolkit. There are also, in recent examples, uh, I pulled up something from Twitter as well from a colleague of mine who has been working at the center of um, the legal response to protests around the country. She works in Atlanta. And part of what we found and what she has seen is that there have been emails sent from a bogus Gmail account called blm at gmail.com. And what we have found is that those emails basically are luring people out to protest where protests are not happening. So thinking about where disinformation might have um, rich breeding ground, we have absolutely seen it in the political arena. 
Um, we are now seeing it in the protest arena, and we've seen it even in the pandemic, thinking about how people are proliferating images and videos that have not been verified. Um, and so one example here is just to think about how you were receiving information from what accounts and what emails. Very often, uh, as we think about disinformation in the election context, we need to gird ourselves against the potential that false accounts may be trying to reach out to us promoting information that is absolutely false and misleading. So here, I want to talk about images and videos because uh, this is sort of my I'm convinced that over the next several months in the lead up to our um, US election in November, we will be seeing more and more misleading and misattributed imagery and videos. So let's talk about it in the COVID context first, and then we'll talk about it in other contexts. Um, the image on the left with these beautiful swans, I talk about these swans in every workshop I do because I find them honestly so moving. I don't know if you remember, but when we started, uh, or if any of you have seen this actually, right when I started working from home, when uh, the pandemic hit here in the United States really hard, and we had to begin issuing around the country various guidelines and restrictions, these images popped up of swans swimming in the Venice canals. There were also then images that popped up of dolphins swimming in the Venice canals. There were images of elephants drinking supposedly wine from some vineyard. And there was a kind of story being crafted that, wow, you know, if there's a silver lining to the pandemic, it is that humans being away and at home are allowing animals to live their best lives. That animals are now able to flourish, the environment, all of this is getting better. And I have to say, I remember it was very early days in the sort of pandemic response. I totally believed it. And I remember, I remember lying in bed, it was a Saturday, and I saw these images on my Instagram. And I said, oh, I, right, I had the emotional reaction. I said, these are beautiful. Look at this water, look how clean it is. And these, they're so white, those beautiful swans. Oh, at least they're thriving. At least, you know, while I'm here at home, miserable, they're thriving, climate, the environment, animals, it's wonderful. And I thought to myself, uh, before I shared it on Instagram, I said, I don't know, it seems kind of too good to be true. And sure enough, it was. And uh, there's been some amazing news coverage about these images. Um, National Geographic has done some and others, if you wanna look into this, basically showing that one, the swans are actually always swimming around the Venice canals, but they often don't swim where tourists are, so they're not photographed very often. But they're often swimming around a southern area in and around Venice, and so it's just a little less populated. Um, dolphins also have been swimming for quite some time and often are there and photographed. And the images of uh, elephants in China drinking wine has not been verified. People haven't been able to figure out where it's from, but it's certainly not now. In the same breath, there were images I remember uh, circulating of animals having escaped from zoos back when the pandemic hit. Those were false. Um, those images, such as a lion roaming uh, public roadways, totally false. Um, and taken out of context. And so it's interesting if you feel yourself um, leaning into some kind of emotion, wow, how beautiful, or on the alternative, and we're gonna get to the other image, wow, how horrible, you may wanna just consider, can I verify this? Um, can I actually be certain of what I am seeing and that it's attributed correctly? Because the image of swans has been misattributed. It is not necessarily disinformation, but it is something being taken out of context and then someone slaps a different caption or comment on it and it makes us think something different from the original content and context. The other example here is uh, this image of Hitler holding a Bible. It has been circulating over the last several weeks now um, after there was a major sort of photo op with President Trump holding a Bible. The image of Hitler was 100% fabricated and uh, photoshopped. And that has also been documented extensively from various news sources. Um, I don't even think it looks very 
well photoshopped, but there we have it. So naturally that image when juxtaposed next to our US president might lead people to think any number of things. They may be offended. They may somehow feel is that a solidarity uh, moment or action with the Nazi party. These are intensely controversial questions. And so when we think about why that was created, frankly, it appears like it was created to sow discord and especially aimed at liberal viewers so that they would further get upset by the image of President Trump. And many have speculated that this at the heart of disinformation is what's so terrifying that we see things and because they are emotionally jarring, because then they proliferate online so quickly, we just naturally believe them. And then we change and base our assumptions and our opinions on those. And it's dangerous in every context. It's dangerous when we think about something like the pandemic, that potentially we may be changing our values and our behaviors based on what we hear. At one time, for example, there were questions around if you gargle with saline, could you kill coronavirus in your mouth? Maybe you would adapt your behavior and practices knowing that, thinking that that is actually credible and authentic information grounded in science when it is not. You may also then be getting emails in a context like our protests that we've seen lately, luring people out. And without being able to verify and understand what you're seeing, you may fall prey to going somewhere physically and, and then not knowing where you are. Why were you lured out by a fake account? And so in the political context, all of the ways that we make choices, um, controversial or even mundane, really can be deeply, deeply impacted and swayed by disinformation. So what can we anticipate uh, in the months to come? Well, I, I, I think there are a few things. Um, I am 100% sure that images and videos are part of what we need to begin getting incredibly, incredibly intelligent in discerning. Um, part of that is because we know that memes and that videos taken out of context, sometimes edited, can absolutely be ways, the fastest way that we digest disinformation. So some of what we have here are just a smattering of the, the top hits, in my opinion, that you need to be aware of in the election context. Um, one of them is absolutely the video issue and imagery. Um, some think that deep fake videos are going to be a, a big problem. Deep fake videos are videos created with very sophisticated technology that absolutely have a fabricated meaning and often can imitate real people. Um, in my opinion, I think there's also something called cheap fakes to be worried about. Um, you know, the doctored videos, deep fakes, just are sometimes so sophisticated and they will come out from experts as being uh, lacking in credibility and unverified and false. But cheap fakes are this other thing that frankly anyone can try to put together a video that's misleading. And so we wanna be really, really careful about what we're seeing when it comes to videos and images. Another one is which platforms to be aware of. I think that we're going to, knowing that video and imagery are um, very, very powerful breeding ground, we need to be careful of places like Instagram, WhatsApp, even TikTok, um, because those can be places where disinformation flourishes, those memes and videos on Instagram. Um, in terms of WhatsApp, part of what I find fascinating is that WhatsApp has actually been used in other election contexts to sow discord. And so if you are in a large group chat, just be very mindful of who is also in there and who's promoting what. Um, in other countries, we have seen WhatsApp be used and infiltrated by bad actors to promote disinformation. And so that will be in very, very large settings where group discussions on WhatsApp will be infiltrated by one, two, and then dozens potentially of bots posing as real people who are pushing content that might at first just be leaning towards a certain type of political bias and then pushing more and more and more. And then finally, there, there's just the question of who will be targeted. Um, I really think that we have to understand that disinformation is absolutely linked to and can contribute to enraging some voters 
to take action and to vote. And then also from uh, disinformation can actually stoke a kind of apathy or sense of disempowerment for other voters. And so if we're thinking about how the pandemic will actually affect our election in November, many are speculating that for health and public safety reasons, we will be seeing more and more mail-in ballots. And the question becomes, can we rely and trust in that process? We absolutely need to be confident in the voter process and in our electoral engagement. And disinformation is currently already we're seeing being lobbed at trying to undermine our voting process here in the United States. And so it's really crucial over the next several months, we will be working at PEN America, for example, on trying to help inform people about, well, what is that process? How and where can I turn for credible information? Because really what we think and what we've often tried to describe to people is that our democracy and our discourse between each other hangs in the balance. And so we want people, especially in these trainings, to feel empowered to know, maybe if they only know a little bit of how to apply media literacy, at the very least also begin to be attentive to all of the hotspots where there may be really, really fertile ground for disinformation. And of course, elections are one of them. So what is this media literacy toolkit? Um, this is, uh, I would say, kind of the heart of our program, of course. And what we want is to reach a point where we're not just reactive online users. We want to be able to promote a kind of digital experience for everyone here. I just looked, we now have over 100 people. It's very exciting. Um, you know, we want to promote an experience where each of you feels like you can take control of your online experience. And that when you do that, you are getting information in a proactive way and you're, you know how to verify what you see. There have been some promising um, research findings actually in the last year or two about how adults can respond when they are told that certain things they see are actually less credible. You know, Facebook back in 2016, as uh, I mentioned earlier, tried these disclaimers, third party fact checkers that provided information for people about what they're seeing. And it really wasn't met with great success. But over the last several years, there have been more and more research studies that examine how our behavior might be affected and can benefit from the way that we consume, even the kind of tiny notifications we receive when we're online. Um, and so I want you to always think, if you're about to share something, if you're in that moment before, think about these trainings and think about you know, if you have no notification from Twitter, no notification from Facebook, but you're going there for your news, you want to be able to think about, is this credible? Um, some research findings, for example, uh, in 2018, Gallup found that over 60% of U.S. adults said they would be less likely to share a story from places that were labeled as unreliable, which meant they were kind of beginning to think twice about what they saw and how they either shared or didn't share. And then last year, um, in 2019, a study conducted by the University of California found that labels on social media platforms can be effective to some extent, which means that when people get some kind of flag, it probably has to be carefully crafted, but that when they get some kind of flag, that actually can have the effect of reducing people's spread that actually people begin to think very carefully and, and limit their uh, publisher power to promote disinformation, which is a really exciting finding. So what is our first step here? Because it really relates to that. It, it's really just to take control of your experience. And I would urge all of you to go back to some of the questions from the beginning of how and where you consume information. You want to conduct this digital scan to think about how you are consuming information, whether it's news, whether it's just people's opinions that you follow on Twitter, just begin taking that scan. And part of what it can do is help you move from being in a reactive posture online to then being in a much more proactive um, and excited, empowered position. So I, I never want to just have people leave these trainings and sessions by understanding, oh, I just have to feel more skeptical of what I see, because that, that's really no long-term solution. And so instead, it has to come back to, well, how can I take control of my online experience? And so I think it does begin with conducting that scan.
I think second then, you have to question what you see. And I wouldn't necessarily frame it as that you have to be skeptical, but you do have to wonder what are you seeing? Um, you know, disinformation thrives on engagement. We've gone over this now multiple times throughout our training. It thrives on the likes and the shares uh, because it means more people will see it. And so the headlines are often crafted with the intent to lure you in, to deceive you. And in thinking through what you see, if you're beginning to take that digital scan, you want to be able to know, well, what is this? I'm not sure I even want to click on that link. And then that really gets us to, to step three, which is in understanding what you're seeing, you want to distinguish between a few different things. Um, I remember when the pandemic hit, so much of what we saw, well, at least what I saw on Twitter, was punditry. People who had some kind of platform and, and following having quite a lot of opinion about everything. And I would say it's a great first step if you want to begin to think about what you're seeing to distinguish between news and opinion. Sometimes things like op-eds, an opinion piece, may seem to you when you click it like a credible journalistic piece of investigative reporting. And it's wonderful to consume op-eds and people's opinions, but it's useful to know that it's an opinion. And so what that means is you can always take it with a grain of salt. Um, and part of why we so often push and advocate for this is because in understanding what you are seeing and the types of news, you can actually begin to gird against and be on guard for what are fake news outlets. And in the last several months, PEN America has begun examining this. We've looked at, they're called pink slime sites. Um, you know, uh, there's a hallmark, I would say, of credible journalism, if you will, that's accuracy. That is really the notion that journalism is, is trustworthy and that it's based on evidence. So that, what does that mean? It means that journalists will often rely on research, they will rely on their sources, they cite to their sources, they will then always try to pursue a kind of truth in their reporting, which is grounded in facts. And part of why disinformation is so problematic is that that has been attacked in the last several years. So on the flip side, what's been interesting is to see that where, for example, real outlets might make a mistake and correct it, there are these other mushrooming sites we are seeing in which fake outlets may have something like a masthead that looks sort of like the New York Times or uh, the Washington Post, where it's, it's beautiful and um, the, the masthead looks somehow credible. It has fake articles that might also somehow seem reputable. So maybe it's called something like the local Gazette or Chesapeake Bay Times. And so you see it and what do you do? You fall prey. You fall prey to seeing that and reading the stories and believing them because they're really not real sites. They are masquerading as purveyors of news and they are not. And so it's really critical if you begin to go down some rabbit hole, some uh, news article reading binge, and you see various sites that you're linked to and that you're checking out, you might wanna consider well, what are the hallmarks here of journalism? And is, am I seeing credible, responsible journalism? In the same breath, I will say one of the things that we've noticed is that there is a kind of new tension and, and question for members of the media around how we deal with objectivity. Um, I'll give you a really interesting example recently. Um, Alexis Johnson is a reporter from uh, Pennsylvania who was barred from covering recent protests um, in Pennsylvania for her post that she put on Twitter. You'll see uh, at the end of May, she posted something saying, oh, this is horrible, look at these looters. If you remember, there was quite a bit of news about how rioting and looting were happening all over the country. And then she said, oh wait, these are pictures from a Ch Kenny Chesney concert, uh, Tailgate. And what was interesting is that clearly she was po poking fun, but she was also revealing a kind of personal bias, personal view that why are we talking about looting here if we're not talking about it in other contexts? 
And the end result was that she was absolutely targeted by her boss, um, targeted by the newspaper where she worked in Pittsburgh, and not allowed to cover the protest. There's also now been a kind of growing movement, especially in the wake of how these protests have been covered, for reporters to think about what objectivity means, how we consider those hallmarks of journalism. And so when we as online users are thinking about and identifying these various hallmarks, the accuracy elements, the corrections policies, the standards that journalists use, where they quote their sources and they are pursuing evidence-based conclusions. We want to also be aware that there is this growing tension and it's further an, like yet another nuance and wrinkle in trying to become as empowered and educated as we can in these issues so that we can, again, stem the spread of disinformation. So I want to go back now to what our fourth tip is. Um, if what you've done so far is you've conducted your digital scan, you're thinking about where you get information, where you get news, then you begin to distinguish and think through what am I seeing? Is this news? Is it opinion? Have I maybe fallen prey to a fake news outlet? Am I seeing video image that's actually real? Or maybe it's something else. And then this is the moment. This is hands down my favorite slide of our entire presentation. What you do before you share something. Because that's the moment. And that is the moment that I will always try to reach you at. Right there where you're holding your phone and you say to yourself, oh my gosh, something has played on your emotions. There maybe seems to be a credible or a patina of credibility. You've seen people engaging intensively on a piece of content and you want to share it. You want that hormone, that dopamine fix, right? And then what happens? I want you to do two things. One, check the credibility of the source. The site that you're on, maybe even the account that's posting something might sound legitimate, but it may actually not be. And so there are a few tools that we're gonna give you tonight in ways to check where your sources are and how to fact check what you're reading. Because then the most important thing is to fact check that actual article. And um, if, if you feel like you've gone through the barrier of at least checking the credibility of a source, you wanna be able to then make sure that what the actual contents of an article are real. So a video, maybe it's a real video, but it could be misattributed. It could be something from 2013 and just made to seem like it's today. And so if you're trying to fact check and verify what you see, I want you to try to promise yourself that you will do that before you share. Because we all have the power to help limit how much misleading and harmful content our friends are seeing, how much our colleagues are seeing, and our families. And so if you come away literally with one thing, it is that moment right before you share, and what do you do? You wanna pause and you wanna think about, well, what's the credibility of this source? Can I fact check actually what I'm seeing? Can I verify that this is real and that it's happening now or yesterday or recently? Here are a few what, in my opinion, are really great fact-checking sources. Um, I am always now going to have up some of our health and science fact-checking guides because I think that knowing where to turn in the pandemic is really critical. Um, there is so much we do not know about the virus and there is still so much conspiracy theory and extremist content being promoted and pushed out about it, leading people uh, to do a variety of different things. So always check what the World Health Organization is doing and even the CDC. There is also then a really useful uh, tracking center from NewsGuard, which monitors content related to the coronavirus that is actually false. And so if you wanna look at what that rack up of content and articles look like, check out their tracking center. All Sides and Snopes are also other credible fact-checking resources. Snopes has been around since the 90s, since 1994. And so I always include Snopes, though many have tried to discredit Snopes. Um, one of my favorites, I have to say, is PolitiFact by Pointer. Uh, it is really a tremendous outfit. And I would say it's probably my favorite and go-to fact-checking website. 
And then finally, Duke Reporters Lab has a reporterslab.org site, which is actually, it's sort of like a Russian doll of fact checking. It provides you with more fact checking resources. So it isn't actually fact checking content so much as giving you additional fact checking places to check out. Um, at the end of this workshop, I will say, you will be getting a summary email that includes all of these resources. So you don't have to be worried about losing them or writing them down right now or anything else. I do want to give you a sort of a, a package deal, if you will, of what are the top line ways to verify what you're seeing. Um, because it isn't just enough, perhaps, to ask the questions. And maybe you don't quite feel ready to check out fact checking guides or websites. So what do you want to do? I think you want to think about a few different ways to verify what you see, to make sure that it's real, credible, and authentic. One of them is looking at images and videos. And in particular, I think you want to run a Google image search. This is sort of a, uh, people who have ever attended some of these trainings in the past might know. This is what I often call our extra credit. That when you run a Google image search, that means that you've clearly made it all the way through the rest of it. That you are implementing and thinking through very critically how to apply media literacy into your daily lives. And you've gotten to the point where you see an image, you can even take a screenshot of the first clip of a video and run a reverse image search, which allows you to see what the origins of a video or image are. You also then want to consider where and when something comes from. Um, that is the fundamental question that I think we're facing right now, is content that might not be fake, but it's just been misattributed and construed to seem like it's now. And uh, I would point you to First Draft, which has a fantastic pocket guide to verifying videos. It's a very good pocket guide, which we will include in our summary email when we send you one uh, later this week. And then finally, I want you to think about accounts and sources. I think we're, we're now slowly becoming more aware of all the ways that outreach and uh, accounts might be absolutely fake. And so in the lead up to the election, if you see content, if you see accounts that are promoting something, think about, well, is that real? And one of the best ways to discern on social media what you're seeing is thinking through how much activity and engagement an account has. Because very often a fake Twitter account will have maybe recently joined and have very low engagement, but quite a lot of activity pushing out content. So think through those questions. And then finally, I always say, don't fall for fake news outlet sites. Um, apply those skills. Think about, can I go to the learn more about us um, or who we are pages on the websites that you go to and confirm before you share. I think we're doing so well for time. Um, we now have about 25 minutes um, in which I want to open it up for our questions. I will say uh, in sort of the, the summary for us here before I open it up, please stay in touch with PEN America. Um, I've put all of our Twitter handles here, PEN America, my own, and our Dallas Public Library colleagues. Um, as I mentioned at the opening of all of this, you know, Dallas is sort of very near and dear to our hearts at PEN America because we have a chapter there. And so we are coming back all the time. Um, I am excited for us to be doing more in our series with the Dallas Public Library. We are looking forward to doing more programming with journalists, um, with community members, trying to help people really understand how to break down that distrust um, and the lack of awareness of what we see 